Okay. So the likelihood function for this sample is this, which would be that. Okay? find the MLE, you differentiate this with respect to theta and set it equal to zero. I'm sorry. Log. So you could leave it like that, or you could expand this to this form. And then we differentiate that. We get minus n over theta plus 1 over theta squared sum of the xi's. Set this equal to 0. We get n over theta must equal 1 over theta squared sum I equal 1 to n x i, which is the same as when you multiply through by theta squared and divide by n, theta is equal to x, theta hat equal x bar is the MLE. Okay? So that's part B. In part A, you might want to go one more step and write this as a thing inside the parenthesis here, but it wasn't necessary. And then finally, is this an unbiased estimator? That's the question of whether the expected value of the MLE is theta, the parameter. But what is the MLE? It's x bar. out the 1 over n and then exchanging summation the expected expectation we got come to this these are iid so all these numbers are the same and we have n of them so we get n times the expected value of x1 divided by n so that'd just be the expected value of x1 and um, well you can check or, or uh, maybe you remember this is theta but uh, just to check you integrate And this comes out to be theta. So the answer is it's unbiased. And then for two, There's an unknown parameter sigma squared in the normal distribution. Um, part A, if uh, x bar is as usual, 1 over, uh, so I, this is 25 here, not n. And the answer is normal mean zero variance sigma squared over 25. Okay. Uh, we've done this before. Um, if you really wanted to check, how would you do that? 
Um, you could compute the moment generating function. If you recall, if y is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared, expected value e to the ty is e to the mu times t plus sigma squared over 2t squared. And if you come across a random variable with this moment generating function, then you know its distribution is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. So let's uh, apply that to compute the distribution of x bar. I'll sneak the n in under the t. Oops, not n. I keep doing n. 25, sorry. OK. We could rewrite this as expected value of the product, i equal 1 to 25 e to the t over 25 times xi. Because <clears throat> e to a sum is a product of the exponentials. And these are independent random variables. So the random variables e to this times xi are independent. And when you, come, when you have an expected value of a product of independent random variables, it becomes a product of the expected value. So by independence, And they're identically distributed, so they're all the same as you would get if you put 1 here. And there are 25 of them, so you get this thing to the 25th power. OK, now we have to compute this. But this is normal with mean 0 invariant sigma squared, and over here, that means we put in 0 here and sigma squared there. And t is t over 25. Okay, and when you have this, you just multiply the exponent by 25. So in the end, this comes out to be e to the sigma squared over 25 divided by 2 times t squared. There are two powers of 25 here. Multiply by 25, you're left with one power of 25. And so now we should be able to identify the distribution of x bar. Here's the moment generating function. What form does that have? It has this form with mu equals 0, and sigma squared is replaced by sigma squared over 25. So it says x bar is, uh, has a normal distribution with mean 0 variance sigma squared over 25. It's something we've used over and over again. Here's another. Proof. We'll even use it again today, later, when we talk about hypothesis testing. And so, what's the moment, uh, method of moments estimator for sigma squared? Well, um, 
here's the parameter. Uh, we have to express that parameter as a function of the moments. Okay. So we're supposed to express sigma squared as a function of the moments. So maybe mu1 and mu2 should be enough. But what's mu1 in our case? Zero. Right? Mu1 is the first moment. Mu2 is the second moment. So this is just a should be expressible as a function of the first moment. And what is a second moment? Mu2 is And what is the second moment? What's the what's the mean of this random variable? Zero. So this would be the variance of xi, so it's sigma squared. So f of mu two is just mu two. So that means that the second uh, Statistical moment is the MME. Okay. And then the question is what's the distribution of that? Well, Xi over sigma has what distribution? What's the mean of that random variable? Zero. And the variance would be one. So what's the distribution of this thing? With how many degrees of freedom? 25 degrees of freedom. So sigma hat squared. Let's call this, uh, what's a good, uh, sigma hat squared would be, um, what do we have to do to it? If we divide sigma hat squared by sigma squared, it's chi squared with 25 degrees of freedom, right? If we divide this by sigma squared, we could make this xi over sigma and then squared. So sigma hat squared has a distribution which is, maybe I'll write it this way, sigma squared times chi squared with 25 degrees of freedom. That's the answer for part C. It's this multiple of a chi squared with 25 degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, maybe a brief review of sufficient statistics.
Okay, so this would be uh, meaningful in the discrete setting where random variables actually take on fixed values. If this is a continuous setting, I would say the following words. The distribution of the vector x1, x2 through xn, given the value of t, does not depend on theta. And the one way to tell or find sufficient statistics is to use a factorization theorem. says that T is sufficient for the parameter theta if and only if The joint density of the random variables x1 through xn can be written as a product of one function, which is a function of t and the parameter, and another function, which is a function only of the data. And this part must be independent of theta. can do that, then T is a sufficient statistic. So um, let's just try to see why this might imply that T is a sufficient statistic in the case of discrete random variables. What do you have to check? You have to check that this conditional distribution uh, doesn't depend on theta. So let's write down that conditional probability there.
So far, so good. I think it's just probability of A given B is probability of A intersect B divided by probability of B. That's all I've done. Let's try to uh, express the denominator. So we just sum over all the values little x1 through x, little xn, which give a capital T value equal to little t. The probability that capital X1 is little x1 through the probability that capital xn is equal to little xn. This gives the probability that t is equal to t. Because how could capital T be t? Well, this must be some value little x1, the next thing must be some value little x2, the last thing must be some value little xn, so that this function of those little x's is t. And then you sum over all the possible ways that you can get little values x1 through xn for the capital T value equal to little t. Okay. All right, uh, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to prove that this factorization implies Sufficiency, and so far we've only used the definition of conditional probability. Sometime we have to use the factorization. So now would be a good time. By the factorization theorem, we can write this as a sum over little x1 to little xn, such that capital T of little x1 to little xn is little t. And then it would be G of capital T of little x1 through little xn and theta times h of little x1 through little xn. Okay. Now we look at this for a few moments and try to decide what to do with it. Uh, what's this thing? How does this depend on these variables? Well, if you look in the index of summation, this thing is always equal to little t. It doesn't matter what the x's are as long as they're one of this set of x's. This thing is little t. So I get g of little t and theta. And are we summing over little t? No, we're summing over the little axis. So no matter which axis we use in this set, we get little t here. And so every term in this sum has the factor g of little t and theta, and that means you can factor it out. And so this is factored. Uh, the only dependence in theta here is in the function g of t theta. No theta here. Okay. All right, so that's the story in the denominator. Now let's check the numerator.
according to the factorization theorem, well, maybe I could say it this way um, before I use the factorization theorem. This is zero if if t of these little x's isn't little t. Why is that? In this probability, we have, right, the, these specifications, right? So what can we put in here? Instead of the big x's, we can put in the little x's because according to this, the big x's are the little x's. And so if this is not t, what's the probability that this happens and this happens? Well, this would be zero, right? And if, if t of x1 through little xn is t, then what's this probability equal to? This condition is redundant. I don't have to write it even. Okay. So now uh, let's consider um, when uh, this is not little t, what's this probability? Zero. And does zero depend on theta? No. No. Okay, good. Zero is zero. Whether it doesn't matter what theta is, zero is zero. Okay. Now when this is true, what do we get in the numerator? Yeah, we get this probability here, right? And by the factorization theorem, what's this probability? It's g of uh, little t and theta times h of x1 through xn if capital T of little x1 through little xn is t. All right, this probability here is equal to this when capital T is little t. Why is that? There it is. The thing on the left hand side is the probability that capital X1 is little x1, capital X2 is little x2, capital Xn is little xn. That's the thing on the left hand side. So it would be this equal to what's on the right hand side. But what is capital T at the little x's? It's little t, so we get g of little t, theta, and then h, okay? So that's what would go in the numerator here if the numerator is not zero. So this thing would be either zero if capital T of the little x's is not t, and if it is t, What do we get? Well, in the numerator we get this. In the denominator we get this. So we divide this by this, the g of t theta cancels. And what's left is h of little x1 little xn over the sum over uh, all changed variables to be little y's okay and t doesn't depend on theta H doesn't depend on theta, and zero doesn't depend on theta, so nothing here depends on theta. Which is the statement that capital T is a sufficient statistic. Okay. So factorization theorem allows you to cancel out the theta dependence here and here. All right, so what did we just do? 
we proved one direction of this theorem. I didn't say proof at the beginning. Why don't I say proof when I'm going to do proof? Oh, it scares students. <laughs> <laughs> you stop listening. But if I say, why, does this, why is this true, then I find people listen. Okay, finally, um, the distribution is from the exponential family. This uh, kind of distribution comes up a lot. This is the density. If the density, I should, if it's, maybe I should say, if its density has this form, and if a distribution has that form, Maybe, can I change this to uh, perhaps a K? If you have IID samples from a distribution that has a density of that form, then the sum of the K of Xi is a sufficient statistic. And this follows from the factorization theorem. Joint density at the parameter value theta would be the product of these individual densities by independence. And then I can put the product inside the exponential of the sum. Like that. And then I sum up d of theta n times. So I get n d of theta. And I sum up the s's. Evaluate at the xi's. OK. And now exponential, when you have sum here, you can write it as product of exponentials. OK, 
Okay, so we factored it into something that depends on this combination of the data and theta, and then something that doesn't depend on the theta at all, just the data. So this is the G of T theta, and this is the H. Okay, and the conclusion is So um, I guess one example, we, we did normal is for Bernoulli with parameter theta. Here the individual density could be written as um, Theta is some number between 0 and 1. You could write it as a sum or you could write it as a product. Um, what's this thing when x is 1? Theta, that's the probability of x being 1. That's the probability of success. What's this thing when x is 0? 1 minus theta, okay? Uh, now does it have that form? Uh, well, that has, it says exponential of something, right? So. How do you convert this to an exponential? It's exponential of log of that. Oops, I'm sorry. This is one minus x here. Sorry, this is an exponential here. So finally, it could be written in this form. And is this a uh, member of this exponential family? Well, what's, if it is, what would C of theta have to be? K of x would be x, C of theta would be log theta over 1 minus theta, and D of theta would be this, and S of x would be Zero. I compare this to uh, where is it? Let's see it. This. This is x log theta one minus theta log one minus theta. Zero, then you get that. So, what's the sufficient statistic for theta? Okay, now do you use that to estimate theta? Is that a good estimator of theta? Is it biased or unbiased? Biased, because its expected value is n theta. So what should we do? We should divide by n. What, so is x bar sufficient for theta? As I mentioned uh, last time, any one-to-one -one function 
of a sufficient statistic for a parameter is also a sufficient statistic for that parameter. So you can multiply by constants, you can add, you can <coughs> take the log or take the exponential, and that'll preserve the fact that the statistic is sufficient. Okay, uh, the last thing uh, I want to mention in this review is something that we didn't do, and that's that uh, if you have another estimator for a parameter, you can do better by taking a sufficient statistic. So in some sense, these are best possible. So what does this mean? Uh, theta hat is some function of uh, random variables that have distribution coming from the density with parameter theta. And so this is the expected value when the random variables have theta as their parameter. And this should be finite for all theta, the second moment. And if t is a sufficient statistic for theta, With equality, if and only if theta hat equal theta tilde. Okay, so um, we're talking about the mean square error. For this, is smaller than the mean square error for that. It'll be strictly smaller if theta hat's different from theta tilde. This function, this estimator, theta tilde, is a conditional expectation of the original one given a sufficient statistic. That means this thing is a function of the sufficient statistic. So it's a sufficient statistic. So you can do better. You can find a, if you have any estimator, if it happens not to be sufficient, you can do better by conditioning on sufficient statistic and taking that one as estimator. If theta hat is unbiased, then theta tilde will be unbiased. All right, because expected value of theta hat is expected value of the expected value of theta hat given t, I'm sorry, theta tilde is the expected value of theta hat given t, and then you take the expected value of that, and that's the same as the expected value of theta hat, which would be theta if it's unbiased. So it says if you're going to look for uh, estimators with smaller variance, uh, you should take sufficient statistics. You can always do better by taking a sufficient statistic. 
So they're kind of they're best possible in some sense. Okay, I think that's the end of the review on sufficient statistics. And we'll take a break, maybe do a couple exercises and start hypothesis testing. Okay, did I assign problem 17 from chapter 8? No. Is this density? Is it 16? Is that 16? Oh, it's 16. Sorry. So what would a sufficient statistic be for this density? Yeah, some of the XIs. Did you do it already or just remember from the? You did it? Yeah. Oh, you did it? Okay, good. So it's easy to see from the uh, exponential family, right? Yeah. You can just read it right off. Did you do 17 or 18 in the discussion? Beta densities? You didn't do beta? Let's do a beta. Okay, so um, use method of moments to calculate, to estimate alpha. So um, let's compute moments for this. X times the density gives you this. If I multiply this thing by X, I just increase the power here by 1. Okay. Oh, yeah, <laughs> 0 to 1. Okay. And uh, for the general beta density, As that form, meaning that if we, among other things, if we integrate this from 0 to 1, we get 1. So that means that the integral from 0 to 1, x to the a minus 1, 1 minus x to the b minus 1, dx, is gamma of a, gamma of b, over gamma of a plus b. And so down here, we find that x 
expected value of x is gamma of 3 alpha over gamma of alpha, gamma of 2 alpha <coughs> times, well, <coughs> if we're going to integrate that, we just use this formula here with alpha equal to, I'm sorry, a equal to alpha plus 1 and b equal to 2 alpha. So we get gamma of uh, alpha plus 1, so this would be gamma of alpha plus 1. B is 2 alpha. So we take A equal to alpha plus 1, B equal to 2 alpha, and apply this formula. We get 2 alpha here over gamma of 3 alpha plus 1. And uh, what do we get then? Um, this and this cancel. Uh, gamma of alpha plus 1 is alpha times gamma of alpha. Gamma of 3 alpha plus 1 is 3 alpha times gamma of 3 alpha. Using that property of gamma functions, gamma of a plus 1 is a gamma of a, right? Using that property twice here, once in the numerator, once in the denominator. So this cancels, this cancels, the alpha cancels, and I get one third, which doesn't depend on alpha. So can we use the first moment, uh, the first statistical moment, like x bar, to? No. No, because it, it'll approximate one third. And uh, one third doesn't depend on alpha. So what's, uh, what do you do next? Well, some of the, one of the moments must depend on alpha. Let's try the second moment. So we multiply the density by x squared this time. So this will make this power alpha plus 2, right? And so using that formula above, not with alpha plus 1 for A, but alpha plus 2 for A. We get this. Gamma of 2 alpha cancels. Uh, we get gamma of 3 alpha. Here we get alpha plus 1 times gamma of alpha plus 1. Do that again. We get alpha times gamma of alpha. Here we get 3 alpha plus 1. And then times 3 alpha times gamma of 3 alpha. We get cancellations. And this simplifies to alpha plus 1 over 3 times 3 alpha plus 1. That's mu 2. OK, we should solve that for alpha. And then we see what function of the second moment alpha is. We need to express alpha as a function of the second moment.
Okay, so we just multiply through by the denominator. <coughs> Let's see, I'll make that 9 alpha plus 3 times uh, mu 2. And then uh, I get 1 minus 3 mu 2 is equal to 9 alpha minus 1. I'm right, 9, 9 alpha mu 2. Let's see. Minus, minus alpha. Minus alpha. Yeah, so, so it's right so far. So I should factor out the alpha here. I get that. And then I should just divide through by the coefficient of alpha there and find that alpha is 1 minus 3 mu 2 over 9 mu 2 minus 1. So if I define sigma hat squared as a sum i equal 1 to n xi squared, where x1, x2, up to xn are an iid sample. Then alpha hat equal to 1 minus 3 sigma hat squared over 9 sigma hat squared minus 1 is the method of moments estimator for alpha. Yeah? Isn't it usually 1 over n? Oh, right. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Forgot 1 over n here. The sample second moment. Okay. That's part A. Part B. How about the MLE? So let's find the MLE. So we take the log of That's L of alpha. Okay. Let's simplify this.
Let me put the alpha minus one outside here. Now we should differentiate. Well, maybe I should put three here. Uh, I, I'm indicating, I, I should have said der derivative of this with respect to alpha, that'd be the derivative of gamma, evaluated at 3 alpha times 3 from the chain rule. And here I'll get uh, a 2 from the chain rule. Here I'll get just the sum of the logs. And here I'll get uh, twice the sum of Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's with respect to alpha. Okay, okay. so we get an a n times uh, 3 gamma prime of 3 alpha over gamma of 3 alpha <coughs> minus gamma prime of alpha over gamma of alpha minus 2 gamma prime at 2 alpha over gamma of 2 alpha plus sum i equal 1 to n logarithm xi times 1 minus xi squared. And this should equal 0. And so alpha must satisfy 3 gamma prime of 3 alpha over gamma of 3 alpha minus gamma prime of alpha over gamma of alpha minus 2 gamma prime of 2 alpha over gamma of 2 alpha. is equal to 1 over n sum i equal 1 to n log xi 1 minus xi squared. Okay, uh, sh I, he, then this line? Oh, uh, in the next line. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Shouldn't it be negative 1 over n? The sum of the log? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, minus plus plus. Yeah. Thank you. That's not a very easy equation to solve. You might look for a uh, formula for the derivative of the gamma function.
but I don't think there's a real, uh, I think there is a, I think the gamma function does satisfy differential equation, but if you differentiate this, it doesn't have a particularly nice form. Rewrite it this way. And I do that because uh, if I'm going to differentiate this with respect to alpha now, I get that. I don't see how to integrate that right off the top of my head. You might be able to. How do you get rid of logs? Let's just try one. Let's make one stab at it. I would try integration by parts. U equal to log x. du equal to 1 over x dx dv equal to x to the alpha minus 1 e to the minus x dx. v is equal to well, we know what that is if we integrate from 0 to infinity, but do we know what it is if we integrate? If it's an, if an, alpha is an integer, I think it'd be something we could do. But anyway, I, uh, just the first terms would be u times v, which we don't know, <laughs> and then integral v to u. But at least I get sort of this. But I don't know the answer here. Okay. But there is a differential equation that the gamma function satisfies, and it, it comes from this, and then the integration by parts. And, well, that's not so statistical, but I think what it says is that there's sort of a complicated equation that alpha satisfies for the maximum likelihood. You could solve this numerically if you have those skills. Is there an advantage to doing MLEs over MMEs? Yeah. So and I think the, the, me, the method of moments one is the one you'd want to use here. Okay. All right. And then uh, the last part here is um, what is the asymptotic variance of the MLE? Well, that's not the last part. But, if you put in random variables x1 through xn here. Okay. To compute asymptotic variance, we know we should do square root of n i of alpha, alpha hat minus alpha is asymptotically normal mean zero and variance one. That implies asymptotic variance. This is, was the central limit theorem for MLEs, remember? Is 
is 1 over n i of alpha. So we have to compute i of alpha. And what's i of alpha? It's minus expected value of the second derivative with respect to alpha of the log of the density evaluated at the random variable x, which has that density. It's also the square of the first derivative of the log of that thing. So let's compute the derivative of the log of f. Actually, I think, in fact, we did that already, right? So we get uh, uh, 3 gamma prime of alpha, 3 alpha over gamma of 3 alpha minus uh, 2 gamma prime of 2 alpha over gamma of alpha, 2 alpha. Minus uh, gamma prime of alpha over gamma of alpha plus uh, log x 1 minus x squared. Okay. When I differentiate this with respect to alpha, I get log x. When I differentiate this with respect to alpha, I get twice this log. And I can recombine them to be like that. And now the second derivative just this part. And so when I compute this, what do I get? Yeah, this is minus i of alpha. So you don't have to compute an expectation here. It's a constant. So the asymptotic variance is 1 over minus 1 over n times this. Okay, and the last part is um, finding a sufficient statistic for alpha.
Well, for sufficient statistics, we either have uh, the factorization theorem to help us, or maybe we can recognize this density as being a part of the exponential family, which is a consequence of the factorization theorem. Does it look like it's an exponential family? I don't have it written down anymore. Not quite, is it? What does an exponential family look like? It would have to be of the form. C of alpha times K of X plus D of alpha plus S of X. That would mean that we'd have to be able to factor out this and that, right? So it's not quite of that form. Or is it? Why isn't it this? Why isn't it like this? Because these two are. Yeah. But maybe we could get it to be of this form. Why don't we multiply these things out? What do we have here? We have an alpha and a minus 1. Uh, the minus 1 times log x, that could come with this s part, right? And the minus 1 times this could come with the s part. Then what's left? An alpha here and a 2 alpha. So we could rewrite this alpha log x 1 minus x squared all inside the log. That's putting alpha times log x and 2 alpha log 1 minus x together. And then we have a d of alpha, which would be the log of this stuff. Right? When I put this here, that's the log of this thing. And then what, uh, what's left? We have a minus log. log x times 1 minus x. So it is in the exponential family. Here's the c of alpha. Here's the k of x. Here's the d of alpha equal to that. And this is the s of x. And so we can read off the sufficient statistic now. So sum of the k of x i's. <coughs> oh, that was a good one. <laughs> okay. 
So you should be able to uh, find sufficient statistics in this, in this way. Uh, a lot of times it'll be from an exponential family. It might not look like it is at first, but be tenacious. Shuffle it around a little bit, and you might find it. Okay. So uh, let's start. Chapter 10, I think. Or is it 9? Nine? 9. Okay. 9. So, a drug company might have uh, two medicines that treat the same malady, developed by two different labs in the company. There's medicine zero and medicine one. The lab that developed medicine zero puts forward the hypothesis that medicine zero is better. The lab that developed medicine one says no, medicine one is better. So you submit both medicines to a clinical trial, and then the, the suits, who don't know any statistics, well, no, the statistician <laughs> decides which one is better. where he decides which hypothesis to accept. H0 is a hypothesis that medicine zero is better, H1 is a hypothesis that medicine one is better. So he <coughs> has uh, some clinical trials, collects some data, gets a test statistic, and based on that test statistic, he decides whether to accept hypothesis zero or accept hypothesis one. This is a hypothesis test in classical case. Another uh, case might be, um, uh, you're in Las Vegas, and you've been playing, well, I'm sure you wouldn't play the slot machines, but let's say somebody you know is playing <laughs> slot machine zero, and somebody else is playing slot machine one at the end of the, and uh, they meet, they're sitting next to each other and said, my machine's better than your machine. And uh, the one said, no, mine is. So they have uh, two hypotheses. Hypothesis zero is that machine zero is better. Hypothesis one is machine one is better. So they <coughs> run some tests. I mean, set, put in a lot of coins. And it's based on some test statistic, which in this case, which would be winnings, they decide which machine is better. Okay, so these are um, hypothesis testing between simple tests. Usually there's some hypothesis Zero, hypothesis one. And this is sometimes called the null hypothesis. Usually this is, this might be in the case of medicine, the medicine that the company's been selling for a long time and then the new version comes out and they want it to see is the new version better than the old one. And then some trials are run.
So here's a uh, simple, very simple example. And you should read this. It's in the beginning of the chapter. Uh, there are two coins. Coin zero and coin one. Toss one of these ten times, or some number of times. I tell you how many heads, heads resulted from this information. We have to decide between two hypotheses. is H0. That's that coin 0 was the one tossed. H1. That's that coin 1 was tossed. Intuitively, what would you do here? What if X, let's say X is the What if x is, uh, say, 1? Then you would what? Except 0. What if x was 9? Probably reject a 0, okay? All right, what about 8? If x is 8, would you accept or reject? 7. Six. Now it's getting into a close range, right? <laughs> Five. Four. Okay, so there's some level that for this st test statistic. Above that level, you accept. Or above that level, you reject. And below, you accept. So. There's something called a rejection region for this test statistic. If this test statistic falls in that re region, you reject. If, and there's some acceptance region, complementary to the rejection region. If the test statistic is in that, then you accept. So we'll do this next time looking at likelihoods. And uh, that's, that'll be what we do for the next four or five lectures.